If you watched any of my analysis videos, you may have heard me talk about visual storytelling, and I'm sure most of you have an idea of what that means. It's a story told through visuals, duh, right? However, how do we determine if visual storytelling is good or bad? Do all visuals tell a story? If they do, does everyone observe them the same way? If not, why not? How do we as creators make sure that the visuals do tell the story we want to tell in our art? Believe it or not, there is actually a method to achieving great visual storytelling, one that can be learned and perfected. In the filmmaking world, it goes by film language, cinema language, or, if you want to be really fancy, semiotics in film. Ooh. And like many other languages, it requires time and practice to learn to read and communicate that language to others. If you are interested in the exact theory of film language, I recommend reading Christian Merz's Film Language, A Semiotics of Cinema. It's a bit of a tough read, but it's very useful if you want to get into the art of cinema. The point is that many great directors and filmmakers have a good grasp of film language. They know how to read it and communicate it. Unfortunately, when the uninitiated are listening to them, it can sound very pretentious. What you know you can't explain but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. Heck, even Martin Scorsese joked about it in that one American Express ad he did. How could I have done this? It doesn't make any sense, look at it. There's no life to it at all. Here, this one, interesting, it's far too nostalgic. Composition is forced, lighting is bad, angle is off. Too literal, too violent, too metaphorical, too dark. Here, we have the protagonist, but where's the antagonist? Huh? Where's the drama? Oh, oh. I did a commercial for American Express where I'm complaining about what I shot on a kid's birthday party. That is, that's what I do. My AD saw me last week. He said, I love the commercial. He said, it's like being back at the monitor. <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> I've lost the narrative thread. To most of us, it's funny that he's overanalyzing these birthday pictures. But really, that's often what those who understand film language do whenever they watch films or look at visual media. Naturally, when you're so tuned into reading film language, you make the mistake of expecting all movies to use it, which is not always the case. It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad movies, they simply don't apply the craft of film language. Think of it like a musician with perfect pitch listening to a performance. They can pick up on the subtle details that most of us wouldn't pick up on. Little trouble there. Then again, some would argue that not using film language in movies makes the movie bad. And there might be some truth to that. Remember when Martin Scorsese said that Marvel movies are not cinema and they're more like amusement park rides? The value of a film that's like a uh, theme park film, for example, uh, in a Marvel type pictures, where, where the theaters become amusement parks, that's a different experience. And it's like, it's not even, it's a, I was saying earlier, it's not cinema, it's something else. Boy, did that got everyone in a tizzy. According to Scorsese, it's not cinema. I got to take a look at that, you know? Well, why did he say that? Because it's his opinion. and he's, But it is cinema, isn't it? I mean, it plays in theaters. And basically what Martin Scorsese has just done is he's gotten on a pulpit and said, you unwashed masses, shame on you. Marty, stop. Just stop. Cinema is like a label that he's trying to keep away. He's like, no, you can't have it. It's, you have to earn Yeah, this. exactly. I think it all boils down to definitions. For many people, cinema and film are words used interchangeably. Cinema is film, and film is cinema. It's yeah. cinema! They're uh, film! I'm not Everything is cinema if it's a film. It's not necessarily a bad way to look at it, but then you have to define film, and that opens up a whole can of worms. The Cambridge Dictionary states that film is a series of moving pictures, usually shown in a cinema or on television, and often telling a story. By that definition, a vlog or even a let's play could be considered a film. And if film is cinema, then are vlogs and let's play cinema? Considering how many movies are coming out on streaming platforms now, I don't think you even need to be shown in the cinema theater. But you see what I mean, right? It becomes pretty messy. So I find it difficult to judge people's statements on cinema when I don't exactly know what they mean by cinema. But if I had to put my money on it, my guess is that when Martin Scorsese said Marvel is not cinema, he is simply implying that Marvel movies do not use film language to an extent that classic movies do. He never claimed that Marvel movies are bad, he's just pointing out the fact that they are something different from the traditional film, that they don't use the same film language or techniques that their predecessors did. Again, I can't speak for the man, but that's how I understood it. Me and my buddy Nev had loads of vigorous debates like this over movies. Both of us used to be film students and both worked as video editors, so obviously we both had strong opinions about films and the art of filmmaking. I think the biggest hurdle in our communication was what we consider to be good cinema. For example, I could discuss the decline in quality of Marvel superhero films, but he always considered them to be bad movies from the start. 
And sure, when you compare a Marvel film like Iron Man to, let's say, The Godfather, I can see why anyone would say that Iron Man is trash compared to that standard. The trouble with those comparisons is that the two films aren't even playing the same game, which is what I believe Scorsese's point was. I think Iron Man is a good movie, because it has good writing, performance, action, and special effects. Does it use film language? Barely. But not using film language doesn't make a movie bad in my opinion, it just puts them in a different category. I call these categories the levels of visual storytelling. I prefer visual storytelling over film language because I don't like to limit the criteria to just film. And it sounds a bit less pretentious, I think. While you find that the quality of film does typically go up with levels, being at the higher level doesn't inherently make the film superior to other levels. I primarily use these levels as a way to easily categorize media discourse and offer an even playing field for movies and other media. Naturally, the biggest issue with these categories is that it's not always clear which level a movie belongs in, since many movies can have elements that may put them in either category. But it's more of a way to determine how harshly we're going to critique certain elements of media. If a film is not even trying to use the film language techniques beyond the basics, it doesn't feel right applying the same criteria we would to a film that does. It's like comparing Expressionist and Renaissance paintings on which one is more realistic. It just doesn't seem fair. But with all that out of the way, let's begin. Level 1 is your films that just tell the story as written on the script. Filmmakers for this level don't pay too much attention to the shot composition or unique lighting besides making it look good and understandable for the viewers, resulting in flat and samey shots that simply show the viewer what's happening. As long as the characters are in frame and doing things, that's acceptable. Visual wise, you'll probably see a lot of mid shots, close ups and maybe some over the shoulder shots. Occasionally you will see some wider shots or pans to show off whatever information the viewer needs, but it rarely challenges the viewer to read deeper into the shot. Films on this level tend to tell rather than show, so the biggest giveaway is the dialogue. Typically characters in these movies will tell the viewer how they feel or any other necessary information, usually in a very direct way. You got the super speed and everything, but Maddie and I? Totally defenseless, probably gonna get blown up. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. There's often a lot of exposition and it's not hidden behind natural sounding dialogue. No, what you are is a neo-imperialist enforcer from halfway around the world sent you to steal my country's natural resources. Western animation, especially adult cartoons, tend to stay in level one to keep budgets low and quickly tell the stories. They're a lot more dialogue focused and end up pretty much saying what the audience should know about the characters at that moment in time. Bojack Horseman is probably one of the biggest culprits of this. As you know, I was hurt, but then I realized that's just how you are. You know, maybe I just need to stop expecting you to be a good person so that way I won't get hurt when you're not. See what I mean? It's storytelling that relies predominantly on non-visual elements. If I muted the audio, you would have no idea what's going on. You might try to read the emotions, but that's about it. TV shows and sitcoms often rely on this type of filmmaking, as they have stricter deadlines and don't really have time to dwell on shot compositions or intricate blocking. They need to get it done, so as long as the camera is positioned neatly, the lighting is good and the actors are there, they just shoot. Now obviously you can find some interesting shots in these movies or shows, but there are far too few and far in between. It's not really a consistent thing like in other movies. And as I said, just because a media isn't level 1 doesn't inherently make it bad. It simply means it's unfair to critique it on visual storytelling capabilities. Instead, one would focus on other aspects such as writing, performance and other elements seen in the shot. Married with children doesn't need fancy visual storytelling. It knows what it is and focuses on making it funny and entertaining. Just about had enough of you! Well, you wouldn't say that if I came with fries and a medium drink. <laughs> Level 1 is where a lot of good writing can be found and many TV shows rely on good writing to compensate for the lack of visual storytelling. It's a shame that many blockbusters are getting more and more content making movies at this level, but essentially what you see is what you get. There is very little hidden subtext or camera compositions that encourage the viewer to gain more out of what they're seeing. In some cases you don't even need to see the visuals, just switch off the monitor and listen to it like a radio play. Hey, that's pretty good. Level 2 is probably the most difficult to define because it starts to implement some amount of film language to reveal hidden subtext and deeper meanings behind the visuals. At this level, the dialogue tends to be more subtle not, not quite my tempo. and the visuals complement the goals of the writing. A quick example of level 2 visual storytelling would be the flag seen in Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers. The symbolism, I think, is pretty clear. Rohan is falling. And I think many people would have that interpretation, or at least a variation of it. But why is that exactly? Why do we come up with the same idea when we see a shot like this? That, my friends, is film language. The visual of the flag falling has a meaning beyond what is shown. 
Level 2 is where viewers can find metaphors, allegories, running themes, and a whole lot of character development. A good script helps, yes, but now, viewers get more meaning out of what they're seeing. Honestly, the gap between levels 2 and 3 is very narrow compared to 1 and 2. In fact, I would argue that most feature films pre-2015 had level 2 visual storytelling as the bare minimum. Since it was Christmas recently, a pretty good example of a level 2 movie would be How the Grinch Stole Christmas. Yes, the Jim Carrey one. Take a look at the scene where the Grinch comes to take the Holiday Cheermeister Award. Even without knowing who the Grinch is, we as the audience can already infer how the Grinch feels about the townspeople and how the townspeople feel about him. <laughs> However, there are a few cuts to Martha May and Cindy Lou, which establishes that they have a more important connection to the Grinch. Throughout the scene, we occasionally cut back to them reacting to the Grinch's antics, showing their liking for the Grinch growing. I also really like how they use the chair of cheer and the food tasting competition to explore the change in Grinch's outlook on Christmas, but also how Christmas can bring people together. At first, the Grinch is reluctant to join the festivities, trying to pull away from the crowd as the town folk force him on the chair of cheer. The camera is mounted on the chair, which traps the viewer on it along with the Grinch. It's already an interesting shot that helps the viewer empathize with the Grinch more. The tasting scene also has a setup and a through line. The first time around, the Grinch is fighting the pudding that is being stuffed into his mouth. For the fruitcake, he simply tries to refuse it, and for the fudge, he finally embraces the task. On the surface level, he is force-fed food, but at a deeper level, he's being forced to take in Christmas itself, something he has refused to do for a long time. After a few other events, the Grinch and the townsfolk get comfortable with one another. The Grinch seems to have embraced the festivities. Just look at how he's presented on the chair now. Compare that to how he started. We also made back full circle as we returned to the stage, but the original attitudes are gone. The crowd is not scared and the Grinch is not abrasive. We don't need to hear the Grinch say he's happy or that he changed his mind. We can see it. So if level 1 prioritizes the what is shown on screen, Level 2 prioritizes why is it shown on screen. It forces us as the viewers to read deeper into the visuals and find the hidden subtext within. Nice. Finally, we reach level 3, the peak of visual storytelling and film language. At this level, the how is just as important as the what or the why, and allows filmmaking to become its own distinct art form. Level 3 is where you'll find the classic movies like Godfather, 12 Angry Men, Citizen Kane, Alien, Goodfellas, 2001 A Space Odyssey, and many many more. What I define as level 3 visual storytelling is when a movie or show doesn't just use film language, but elevates the fundamentals to create a truly unique storytelling experience. The shot composition, lighting, performances, and production design create a visual that can be seen as a work of art on its own. A good indicator is when the original work is being parodied or referenced by other films. It kinda implies that this specific shot or scene resonated with the viewer so much that it can be recognized as a piece of art on its own. But being at level 3 doesn't instantly make a movie a masterpiece. It just means that the filmmaker understands film language very well and can maximize its effectiveness as an art form, just like a musical composer or an artist. So the most important trait of level 3 visual storytelling is intentionality. Now we as the audience are looking at the intention of the shot, the intention of the cut, all those little tiny details. The shot compositions are so well thought out, they can achieve multiple goals at once, whether it's to set the tone, develop a character, or establish a relationship. That's why many of these films have longer, lingering shots with minimum dialogue. The filmmaker is letting the audience take in the shot, because there is a lot to take in. It's a bit like listening to a musical piece. As a casual listener, you may not be able to consciously understand all the techniques the composer has used to compose this piece. It just sounds good, and you like it. Of course, the listeners who understand those techniques and can recognize them can easily explain exactly what makes this musical piece good. This is true for film. If you study film, you can start to read the shots and recognize their intention. How about we do a few scene analysis right now and I'll show you what I mean. Be warned though, because film language is not an exact language system, some interpretations can vary from person to person, so it can sometimes be a bit like listening to wine tasters. Mm. A little citrus. Maybe some strawberry. Mm. Here's a scene from The Godfather Part 2. It's a scene where Mafia boss Michael Corleone and his older brother Fredo are having a conversation after Fredo betrayed Michael. We start with the wide shot of the two brothers talking, but look how far apart they are in the shot. Even the window frames work like walls that separate the two siblings. And the lighting is dim, hiding the two characters and indicating to the audience that this is a private conversation away from the eyes of others. It's just Michael, Fredo and the viewer. Michael is sitting on the chair 
while Alfredo is lying on a recliner. The two of them look more like therapist and patient rather than brothers. Michael is calm and professional, sitting up straight, while Alfredo is laying back. Even their conversation sounds like a therapy session, at least at the start. I haven't got a lot to say, Mike. We have time. I was kept pretty much in the dark. I didn't know all that much. And it makes sense. Michael needs Freyo to give information that may help him. And for that, he needs Freyo to open up. But even then, Mike is growing impatient and he stands up and goes to look at the calming water outside. However, there's never a reason why Mike stands up. We cut back to a wide shot when Mike says, I've always taken care of you, Fredo. Notice how Mike towers over Fredo and how he's looking down on him. Visually, it indicates power and authority, which is also the catalyst for the main conflict. Taking care of me? You're my kid brother and you take care of me? Did you ever think about that? Huh? Did you ever once think about that? Fredo felt unappreciated and wanted to be heard. But even as he starts raising his voice, Michael just looks away from him, showing disinterest. That's when we cut to Fredo. He is now being seen and heard by Michael and the viewer. I'm your older brother, Mike, and I was stepped over! That's the way Pop wanted it. It ain't the way I wanted it! I can handle things, I'm smart! Not like everybody says! Like dumb, I'm smart and I want respect! Fredo does open up, but not in the way that Michael wanted. Unfortunately, this doesn't bring them together. Look how much space there is in both shots, they couldn't be further away. The next time we see the two brothers together is only during their mother's funeral. Again, we get to see Mike looking down on Fredo and the close-ups still have a huge gap between them. Until finally, Mike starts moving in closer. He enters Fredo's frame, symbolizing Michael entering Fredo's life again. Hmm, that's some good visual storytelling. Here's another example from Wolf Children, as it has a sibling conflict too. Ami and Yuki are siblings who can transform between human and wolf forms. In this particular scene, the two are arguing whether they're wolves or humans. The scene starts rather calmly in a safe, well-lit kitchen, but look at the camera composition. First of all, the camera is set slightly above the character's eye level, with the table in front, almost like the filmmakers putting us as the adults sitting at the table too, and watching these two kids interact. The symmetrical placement of Ami and Yuki invites us to pick a side between the two points of view. The empty chair that their mother Hannah would sit in acts both as a divider between them, but it's also symbolic of their independence. No longer is the mother there to make these choices for them, or interfere between the two of them. Observe the intentionality of the first cut. Look, just come to school already, Ame. No thanks. Why not? Because I'm a wolf. You are a human. No, I'm not. <laughs> we cut to Ami exactly at the moment when he says that he's a wolf. And we cut back to Yuki when she disagrees with him. Isolating both characters emphasizes their disagreement more. Not only that, it highlights the importance of their viewpoints. Now we cut back to the wide shot again, but there's a lot more tension since the conflict was introduced and highlighted. They continue to argue, but the next shot is an over-the-shoulder shot because Yuki is forcing her views on Ame. She is in his space physically and ideologically, which is why he flips the table and creates the barrier between the two. Again, it's both a physical barrier and a barrier in their relationship. The two start to fight and their mother enters the room. I love this quick cut to the two kids fighting. It's so quick that your brain can't fully read exactly what's happening, which is what Hannah is experiencing too. She's not sure what's going on, so she just ends up watching the two siblings fight. We see a bit of that level 2 visual storytelling as the siblings turn fully feral, indicating that this fight is no longer a civil or an intellectual one, but an emotional one, highlighting how important their choices are to them. Pay attention to the damage done to the house during this fight. It's not just the house that is falling apart, but the ideal family that Hana worked so hard to build throughout the movie. After the fight, Yuki slams the door on Ame and stays in the bathroom, leaving him to listen to her crying. I can go on and on analyzing the whole movie like this, but you get the point. There is thought and intention behind every shot, scene, creative decision that elevates the story beyond its writing. It's hard to analyze a level 1 movie like this without reaching. I mean you can try, but you will find that it doesn't feel as smooth and consistent as a level 3 movie. If the shot cuts to something else, there is a specific purpose behind it. It's not just there to keep the viewer's attention. You start to analyze who enters the shot, who leaves the shot. You begin to notice the presence the characters have in the shot, the power dynamics, the background, and the characters in the background. Level 3 movies aren't just lit nicely, 
They utilize what can and can't be seen in the scene, and typically that has a narrative purpose. You will also see some unusual shots too, as more experienced filmmakers have a good understanding of the rules of shot composition, but will also know when it's acceptable to break those rules to get the right frame for the narrative. These movies don't mess around with unnecessary shots. If you see something on the screen, then it's something important. Alien is a great example. At the start of the film, we spend some time with the different crew members in different locations of the ship. The scenes allow us to get to know the characters, but also familiarize with the ship itself. So we have a good understanding how the different areas are connected. So later, when the characters are chased by the alien, we, as the audience, already know where the action takes place in relationship to other places. Honestly, I could gush over movies for hours and hours, I swear to God. And I can't blame Martin Scorsese when he says Marvel films aren't cinema. Because when you learn to read film language, you end up confused and sometimes even offended by the lack of meaning or intention behind the shots in those movies. But it's not just Marvel films, it's a lot of mainstream blockbuster movies. Sadly, film language as an art form is rapidly dying, at least in mainstream western media. Now, I say there are three levels, but there's actually a level zero. This is dedicated to not just films and animation that don't use visual storytelling, but those that pick visuals so poorly that it actually contradicts the writing and the tone that it's trying to set up. I thought I'd struggle to find a good example, but then I realized there are so many modern movies to choose from. Like the scene from Rise of Skywalker, where Rey decides to take on Kylo Ren. In this scene, Kylo Ren is in his ship, flying straight at Rey, who is standing in the middle of the desert. We have an establishing shot with Rey in the first third of the screen, waiting for Kylo, who is far, far, far in the distance. He's so far away that I had to rub the screen to make sure it's not a smudge, but yeah, that's him. For what the movie's trying to present, he's way too far. Kalo is meant to be an intimidating enemy for Rey, but in this shot he's a small, insignificant little speck. The way Rey is framed makes it appear like she's ready to take on the danger ahead, but then we cut back to her looking scared. Okay, so I guess she's frozen in fear then. I don't know why considering Kylo is miles away and she could easily run away somewhere else. Oh wait, no, the camera's moving to her lightsaber. So I think the movie wanted to show Rey mentally preparing to take the challenge on. Okay, I get it. But oh no, Kylo is approaching. He's still miles away though. Maybe Rey will courageously start walking towards him. That would be cool. You know, kind of like the Joker in the Dark Knight. Yeah. Or maybe she will close her eyes and hold the blade in front of her, using all her senses and the force to time the strike just right. Or she will just face away from him. I'm sorry, what? Excuse me, what's happening? Why is she holding a Mario pose? Wait, she's looking back? Did she misjudge how far Kylo is? You see, the movie thinks it's building tension, but it's staying so long, it might as well be a Monty Python gag. Okay, Kylo Ren's ship is getting closer as indicated by the camera moving closer to the ship. Never mind, it's still miles away. Oh, and now she starts running? Did she have to wait for the ship to be at that exact distance to initiate her plan? Again, no visual indication of anything. Speaking of visual indications, why did she have to turn on her lightsaber? Wouldn't that indicate to Kylo Ren that she's up to something? I'm sure he has plenty of time to see a glowing lightsaber. And again, we had these heroic cool shots and now she's just running away with the lightsaber in hand. Okay, Kylo ignores all the warning signs and Rey does a cool backflip attack. Though, jeez, look at the damage on Kylo's ship. Not only is it falling apart, it rolls a mile and explodes. Kylo Ren is so freaking dead right now. At least that's what the visuals are telling me. Oh wait, no, he's perfectly fine. Not even a scratch on him. Great storytelling, guys. I really appreciate it. I'm not going to get into how stupid the technique was, but you can see what I mean about the visual storytelling contradicting the writing. They wanted to achieve tension and heroism, but everything was working against it, ending up looking comical and weird. They wanted cool hero shots for the trailer, but also wanted Rey to outfox Kylo using this technique. But this technique wasn't really set up or anything, it just came out of nowhere. Unfortunately, there's a rapid increase in level zero films, where nothing works like it's supposed to. It can be shot with the highest quality cameras, it can be lit up in the best kind of lighting and have the best special effects, but if the actual fundamental rules of visual storytelling are nowhere to be found, what's the point? That's why I thought it was useful to talk about the importance of visual storytelling. I believe that understanding its value may help people be a bit more selective with what films they watch and how they watch them. I want the art form to evolve, but if people are content with just having movies as something to play on the second monitor while they do other things, I don't think it will. On the bright side, there's still many great visual narrative works coming from places other than Hollywood. So keep an eye out and don't be afraid to give those a chance too. Hopefully I'll get the chance to cover all kinds of media on this channel 
and now you will have a better understanding of how I categorize them. Thank you for watching the video. If you like this video, consider subscribing to the channel. And if you want to discuss movies and other media with me or other like-minded individuals, I opened up a Discord channel which you can join today. We will be doing live scene analysis and have discussions and events, so don't miss out on that. I will also do a post video live stream a day after this video is uploaded, so if you want to discuss the topic more or you have any questions, feel free to come down. Thank you again, I'll see you around.